Thanks for coming along and thanks for the spirit of this meeting. Because at one level this is an election campaign for the leadership of the Labour Party, but it's also about the kind of party we want and the kind of Britain we want and the kind of society we want in this country. That is what's bringing so many people together at the present time. This is the 19th leadership campaign event that I've done in the past two and a half weeks. And they've been massive and they've been open air for the most part. And they've brought together people of all communities, all ethnic backgrounds, a very wide range of political ideas. But they brought people together on the basis that they're fed up with growing inequality in Britain. They're fed up with the levels of poverty that exist. They're fed up with the tax evasion of the richest and the biggest corporations in this country. And so it is about putting forward a political alternative. And whilst last year we fought the leadership campaign in order to try and change the direction of the Labour Party, we're fighting it this year to keep that direction of our party, but also to take the campaign outwards to win in every community all across Britain. A year ago, we were a party that had sadly been defeated in a general election. That general election result was a disaster for the people of this country because it brought back a Tory government committed to more cuts and more austerity. Within a month of the election, they introduced a welfare reform bill, so-called, which tried to take £12 billion out of the pockets of the poorest and most vulnerable within our community. Sadly, at that time, our party thought we should abstain on that bill because we couldn't oppose the Tories' welfare agenda. Well, I tell you this, things have changed. We are no longer accepting that agenda. We're no longer accepting the agenda of cuts in public expenditure paid for by the very poorest, whilst at the same time, as the Panama Papers showed, the richest and biggest corporations systematically, on an industrial scale, evade tax and set up brass plaque companies in tax havens around the world while our public services are underfunded. And when some of our media talk about tax efficiency and the way in which the wealthy can avoid taxes, I simply say this to those that think it's clever. One day you're going to be old. One day you might suffer a heart attack. One day your house might catch fire. One day you might suffer an attack in the street. On that day you'll be glad there are ambulance workers, there are firefighters, there are police officers, there are public service workers. Who the rest of us pay for because of the kind of society we want to live in. And then you have to look at the way in which young people are treated in our society. Apprentices, grotesquely underpaid, often treated as low-paid workers and not given the real training they should be given. Some apprenticeships are very, very good, some less so. Cannot we make it clear that we expect young workers to be properly treated, properly trained, fully qualified at the end of it, and paid a decent living wage for the work they do as trainees or apprenticeships? For those that go on to college, go on to university and sadly leave with massive debts, we've seen the effects of high fees and high cost for student living. Up until a few years ago, the number of students from poorer and working class communities going to university was rising. As the fees have risen, the numbers have gone down and universities are becoming too expensive for too many people. Cannot we do what other countries have done?
and simply say this. When somebody is well educated, a good apprenticeship, a good degree, a good qualification, a good engineer, a good architect, a good teacher, a good nurse, a good doctor. Yes, of course they benefit individually. Of course they do. But we all benefit as well because we've got a better educated society. So isn't it time we stopped treating education as a commodity and instead said education is a right for everybody and a right that we all benefit from. And so in this campaign, I want to be sure that we put forward a lot of policies. We put forward policy ideas that were good for our party and good for the people of this country. At one level, yes, this is a campaign about who will be the leader of the party. But it is about us. It's we. Last year, it was we who won the leadership of the Labour Party because it was a large popular movement of people who wanted to see politics done differently, wanted communities to be involved in politics and wanted everyone's creative imagination and ideas to contribute to the policy making of our party. So it's also about the team we've got around us. The team we've got who are speaking up for us in Parliament. And I want to say a particular thank you to John McDonnell, who's our Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer. John accepted the job immediately and set about putting forward an economic agenda. An economic agenda which is recognising the problems of the British economy, recognising the injustice of the massive investment going in London and the South East, the much smaller amounts going in the North East, North West and South West, recognising the lack of investment in industry, the lack of skilled training in industry, recognising all of those issues. And instead of accepting an austerity agenda which cuts public expenditure, reduces the role of the state in all public services, encourages privatisation. John says, and he's right, instead we should be investing. So we will be establishing a national investment bank of £500 billion. There will be a northern regional investment bank which will invest in this region to create the 100,000 jobs that are needed that will create the better rail services are necessary and will invest in those high-tech companies that often find it very hard to access capital investment and instead have to sell their ideas for them to be manufactured somewhere else. The creativity and skills of everybody across the whole region must be harnessed and we must be able to develop those jobs. That is what John has in mind. That is the agenda he's putting forward. And as Catherine and others have pointed out, the cuts in public expenditure go very deep and very wide. Local government has taken the biggest hit in all areas of public spending cuts ever since austerity came in. The Tories somehow or other try to blame the poor for being poor. Blame the public sector for the cuts in the public sector. Let's just think two things. One, the banking crisis of 2008 was not created by nurses, street cleaners, doctors, hospital porters or anyone else working in the public sector. It was created by an under-regulated banking system and we bailed that banking system out with £300 billion of quantitative easing at that time and another £60 billion has gone in this week. I don't mind investment by the public. In fact, I welcome it and support it. But I simply say to those banks that we've taken into part public ownership. Your job now is to invest in productive industries, not offshore accounts and buy-to-let landlords. And to Lloyds Bank, who just posted profits of two and a half billion pounds, 
sorry, you should reward those that have helped you achieve that rather than making them redundant and closing branches all over the country. But if you then look at the map of where the cuts have taken place in local government expenditure, you do a map of the whole of Britain and you put a particular colour, shall we say red, for the poorest areas of the country. There would be a red over Sunderland, there would be a red over Newcastle, of Middlesbrough, of Birmingham, of Leicester, of Manchester, of many London boroughs, of much of South Wales, of many areas of central Scotland. And if you put a colour blue over the richest areas of the country, you'd be looking at London suburbs, you'd be looking at Cheshire, you'd be looking at parts of the country where there is a higher standard of living and greater income. Then choose a third colour, shall we say green, and put it over the areas where the greatest public sector cuts have taken place. And you know what? All the red would be obliterated by the green where the biggest cuts have taken place. The poorest areas are suffering the worst, and the most vulnerable people are suffering the worst. The housing crisis affects everybody within our community in some way or the other. I travel a lot around the country, I've always done that, and I spend a lot of time talking to people. I meet many very vulnerable people, homeless people sleeping on the streets, hanging around major railway stations and bus stations, trying to get somewhere for the night. You see them going into parks when the rest of us are leaving to try and find a bench to sleep on at night. You talk to them, they all have individual stories, stories of family breakup, of unemployment, of eviction, of being declared intentionally homeless, of stress, of mental illness, of many other things. And they end up on the streets. They end up with short, miserable lives. They end up dying because of it. Is that necessary? Is it right? Is it morally just in 21st century Britain that we can't afford enough money to make sure everyone sleeps at night with a roof over their head. Is it such a bad ambition to want to invest in housing? And then the number of young children and young families around the country that can't get council housing because not enough is being built and too much has been sold and in high cost areas the council's forced to sell off any vacant property rather than putting a needy family into it. Those children growing up in the insecurity of the private rented sector, the lack of repairs in some cases, having to move school, having to move house. Do you know what happens? They get ill. Do you know what happens? They underachieve in school. Do you know what happens? They underachieve in secondary school. Do you know what happens? We all lose their talents because their talents were not fully developed when they were in school. <laughs> So, this National Investment Bank that John is proposing, and I fully support, will invest, yes, in the infrastructure we need, yes, in the industrial development we need, and in the green energy industries that we need, but it will also invest in housing, invest in council housing with lifetime tenancies and security. Because it's council housing that has achieved so much for so many people. And you know what? There's got to be a virtuous circle here. Instead of housing benefit being paid to private landlords, instead we pay less for people to stay in council housing. The money we save goes in bricks and mortar, goes in jobs in the building industry, goes in jobs in the supply chain, and goes in good health and good living for everybody. It is about a society that is prepared to invest in the needs of all. And this year we've had some victories. We've had some victories over the Tory government. And I'll tell you this, when the Labour Party comes together, when we campaign publicly against the cuts in personal independence payments, the threat to working tax credits, when we campaign against the forced academisation of schools, when the entire Labour movement comes together on that, do you know what happens? We win. We defeat them.
and we've forced them back on a lot of issues. And in the past year, we've changed that political agenda. Now, I'm very pleased to say, virtually everybody seems to be opposed to austerity. Welcome on board. But it's also about injustice and inequality in our society. We're talking about the National Health Service. We're talking about what's happening within our hospitals. I absolutely, passionately, as I'm sure everyone in this square does today, all of us, believe in a National Health Service free at the point of use as a human right. It's our single greatest achievement as a Labour movement. The idea that you get health care because you need it, not because you can afford it. The Tories actually understand the public appeal of the NHS. What they also understand is it costs a lot of money and it spends a lot of money. So they see there in their mindset a market opportunity, hence the Health and Social Care Act, which requires 49% of health services to be put out to the private sector. So we are paying the private sector in order to deliver our health service. We are paying PFI contractors to stay in hospitals that ought to be the freehold property of the people through the National Health Service. And so we have to properly fund our NHS. We have to end the scandal of the PFI system. We have to end the privatisation of NHS services. Because if we don't do that, gradually the waiting lists will get longer, gradually the waiting times will get longer, gradually overcrowding will creep in, gradually a combination of cuts in adult social care, elderly, frail and often very dependent elderly will remain in hospital when they should be getting care at home, it will get worse. And you know what? Those that can afford it, those that can afford it, thanks friend, those that can afford it will uh, go private. And gradually, without us necessarily noticing it day on day, our NHS, instead of being the first port of call for all of us, will become a public health service of last resort for those who can't afford to go anywhere else, as they've got in lots of US towns and cities. So we have to absolutely defend the principle of the NHS as well as its funding and ensure its staff are public employees and public service workers rather than us paying profits to private companies to run our NHS. There's another aspect of it, and that is the health inequality. Every city has it. The poorer you are, the poorer area you live in, the shorter your life. The richer you are, the richer the area you live in, the longer your life. We need to direct investment and support into the poorest areas to give everyone equal chances and equal access. And also bring in real parity of esteem for those suffering mental health conditions. Our mental health services are underfunded. Our attitude towards mental health has to change. All of us here, during our own lifetimes, a quarter of us will suffer some kind of stress or depression, a mental health condition. Some of us will enjoy the love and friendship of family, of partners, of communities, which will help us get through it. Others will suffer in silence. Others will feel that the prejudice against those with mental health conditions will prevent them speaking up about it or helping or getting any help from anybody else. We as a community and a society have got to change our attitude and bring in real parity of esteem within the NHS <coughs> as well as our attitude towards mental health. And I'm very determined that we should achieve that. And so in the points that we're putting forward, we're putting forward a lot. Essentially, it's about developing an economy in Britain that does provide secure work, that does return to the principle of full employment, that does have an expanding economy. 
it is about fundamentally investment. But it's also about attitudes and what we do with it. Too many young people suffer because they don't achieve what they want to do on leaving school or leaving college or leaving university. An expanding economy, a sustainable economy helps them to achieve that. So it's also about how we run our education system. I want all children to get access to nurseries and preschool education so that they get the chance of socialising and coming together. You could almost place a map over those that don't get preschool education with their later achievements and attainments in school. It's what we give to our children in the very earliest years that is so very, very important to them. But it's also about the creative society that we have. It's not just about education for learning in schools. It's not just about skill training. It's also about the creativity in all of us. It's about funding arts for all. It's about culture for all. It's about music for all. It's about that creative spirit for all that we want to achieve within our society. So when the Tories talk of um, freedom in education, freedom for free schools as they call them, freedom for academies, freedom for selectivity in education, I see all these campaigns to bring back the grammar school. There's parliamentary groups on bringing back the grammar school. Do you know what? I've yet to see a parliamentary group saying, bring back the secondary model. It hasn't yet been formed, and I don't think it ever will be formed. Surely to goodness, can't we be proud of the achievements of comprehensive education that brings everyone together so they can learn and respect and understand each other as well as develop to the maximum of their abilities. And for those that think there is freedom in the free schools and the academies, I say this. Teachers should be paid properly. Teaching assistants should be paid properly. Cooks and cleaners and staff should be paid properly. And there should be national pay conditions applying to all schools across the whole country. And local authorities creating that family of education are in a far better place to do that than creating false competition between schools in every community rather than bringing those schools together to share their resources, share their talents and help each other to develop. Surely that's a good message to put to young people in our society. Our, our ten points also include much about equality and justice within our society. Because inequality is a poison. Injustice is simply wrong. Yes, we signed up to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Yes, we signed up to the European Convention on Human Rights. And I'm very proud to say that we passed the Human Rights Act in 1998 and in 2010 the Equalities Act. All these things are very important. But there is still a gender pay gap of 20%. There are still many women earning much less than men, getting lower pensions, being forced to work longer to achieve less in work. There has to be real gender equality within our society. Women must be paid and supported properly. And girls' education must be developing their aspirations to achieve all. And we walk in the footsteps of those that went before us. We learn from the pioneers. Mary Wollstonecraft in the 18th century wrote this, till women are more rationally educated, the progress in human knowledge and improvement will be limited. We have to ensure that every girl is educated as well as every boy. Every woman has the same chance as every man, and every woman is paid the same as every man for what they do. But it's also about unity within our communities and what we achieve together in our politics of community involvement. If we turn in on each other and say that the shortage of housing shortage of school places, the queue at the doctor's surgery, 
or the problem in the local hospital is the fault of the family next door because they're from a different ethnic group or they have a different nationality. If we turn on it, in on each other and say, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, we completely miss the whole point that the real problem is a central government that is handing money to the wealthiest and the biggest corporations and not investing in the poorest. Prejudice, discrimination, racism, abuse, never built one house, trained one doctor, one teacher, one nurse or one school. You achieved by bringing people together. And I know this city, the people in this city are going to stand up tomorrow for a multicultural society where we preach tolerance and the understanding of fairness for all. And so our party is about the strength of communities, is about what we do in this country as well as what we do internationally. I want our foreign policy to be one not of a repeat of the disasters of the Iraq War of 2003 and the lessons we're now beginning to learn from it through the Chilcot Report. Would it not be so much better if the watchword, the axiom, the basis of our whole international strategy was international law, justice and human rights rather than the US-based foreign policies of 2003 and other places, other times. Surely that is what this world is about. The big issues we face are climate change, are environmental, are injustice. We are, we are part of a social movement. That social movement in the USA gained almost the Democratic Party nomination for a self-avowed socialist called Bernie Sanders. That social movement is very strong across Europe and many other places. Times have changed. We've learned the lessons that 30 and 40 years of lectures of neoliberal economics, that the next generation is going to be poorer than us, the one after that's going to be poorer than us, the one over that after that's going to be poorer than us. Sorry. The world is a richer place. We have much greater technology than we ever had before. What hasn't changed is the politics. The politics has to change. A politics of engagement, of involvement, of improvement. A politics of participation of all people so that we develop those policies and change for the good of all. And so our campaign is about changing economic policy, is about workers' rights, is about trade union rights, is about bringing communities together, is about achieving things together. And when we achieve anything together, we're a bit stronger. When we achieve a lot of things together, we're very strong. And when we achieve a great deal together, we are stronger still. That is how we're growing. That is what is so exciting about this campaign. We're taking this campaign to every part of Britain. We've got rallies and meetings in every town and city all over this country. This is a run-up to a general election when we take the same message to all those places all across Britain. That things can and will be done differently. And you know what? Our simple message is quite is put like this. No one and no community should ever be left behind. Thank you very much.